Yes, hello. Um, we're back again, and today we're going to be looking at the sinful, sinless generation. The sinful, sinless generation, and I've subtitled it uh, "Crepful Dollars and uh, Ransom Kitty," and I'll tell you why. A few days ago, um, some of my work, some young people that are mentoring, came calling, and they were so excited. They'd been to some meetings. They'd listen to a man called uh, Crefo Dollars. One of them wasn't sure about the other name, but there was Ransom Kuti, and he wasn't Fela Ransom Kuti, who is late. Anyhow, the bottom line is this. As they began to discuss and they were getting excited, there was a lot of friction between the two of them who had been at the same meeting, and they began to talk about some doctrinal issues. So my, my antenna went up immediately, and I quizzed them, and then went on the internet to go listen to the ministrations that they were so excited about, the dollars, uh, ransom, kuti, or whatever, whoever. I look at the tapes, listen to them, and I think we need to subject some of those things to thorough examination through scriptures. Why? The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 12, that there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and are not yet cleansed from their filth. So having anchored that scripture, I tell you, I went online, and indeed, it was a ministration that was mainly led by Creflo Dollars. So some Nigerians call him Creflo Dollars, you know. And um, having listened, I found out that the thrust of the whole issue was something that wasn't really surprising. You could track it back to that ancient foe of mankind. It was primarily concerned with the issue again of, you can guess it, S-I-N, sin. When you track it all down, it was all about sin and how to deal with sin and what to do with sin. Now, this has been one of the most ancient challenges that the Church of Jesus Christ has had. The early church, when you look at the early church fathers, people like Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Macarius of Egypt, even Gregory of Nyasa, up until the time of Thomas Aquinas, and then even in 1777, John Wesley, wrote, uh, gave a ministration and then published a book in 1777 on a plain account of Christian perfection, which, you know, some interpreted to mean sinless perfection. No, no matter what it is, it's just back to that, back to basics. It's that issue of what to do with sin, how to handle sin in comparison with spiritual growth, expectation of the believer, the expectation of God, what scripture says, and what ought to be done with the issue of sin, more so when a lot of people talk about that state of sinless perfection or Christian maturity, Christian perfection. Now, at this point, I want to put up what they call a caveat emptor, you know, which is that all those who are listening to anything that has to do with this doctrine, one has to beware, like the buyers beware. Why do I say so? Second Timothy chapter 3 says this also know that in the last days perilous times will come perilous risky times will come turbulent times will come for men shall be lovers of themselves covetous boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful and holy without natural affection truth breakers false accusers incontinent fierce despisers of those that are good false accusers traitors heady high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Now, these are the last days. These are perilous days. And now, don't think Satan is stupid, because what he describes the character of man for the, you know, for the end times such as this, there also has to be some satanic intrigues that would want to like capitalize on what the Bible has said would be the profile of the average man who's going to come to church in the last days. Not only that, there also must be churches and ministers that are created to accommodate this kind of persons as well. And that's why you find out that we have to, in this end times, subject all things to scrutiny. In this end times, we need to go back to scriptures, allow the Spirit of God to screen things for us so that we will not make any mistakes and we will not miss it. Now, let me say something. As I begin to like look into this issue, it reminds me of some of the ministrations that 
uh, the brother who's going to be with the Lord used to like talk about a lot. I'm talking about Miles Monroe from, from the Bahamas. Remember, he did warn us that towards this end of the time, there would be what they call the shifting of goalposts, the redefinition of many things that looked as if they were unshakable before. He spoke about, look, look at the issue of homosexuality, for instance, and look at the issue of same-sex marriage, things like uh, the world not wanting to hear about objective moral truths anymore, no absolute good, no absolute evil. He talked about then that the family will be redefined, the new family, instead of a husband, wife, and children, the traditional capture. He did point out that there were certain things going to be happening that would expand the definition, shift the goalposts, so that Satan could go on rampage in the last days. Apart from new family definition, he pointed out that even political polarities, what used to be the right and the left, the left has become more right and the right has become more left, the so-called extreme right, extreme left, all those things are being broad in the end times, more so when the philosophies out there are actually sitting on relativism, where there is, frankly speaking, no borders, no barriers. Actually, to understand and thoroughly interrogate what Crefro Dollars and uh, the you know the other fellow what they were preaching that I listened to online, for you to judge this thing, it would have been nice but not compulsory if you had a background that has done some research into what they call docetism. Docetism in those days was a doctrine which, in ancient times, was the doctrine held that um, Jesus or what they called the phenomenon of Jesus was actually all spirit and that he was never really flesh. He was more like he appeared to be. It was called docetism, which denied the humanity of Jesus Christ and said that, no, no, he's all spirit. So in all reckoning, there's a kind of spiritual reckoning we have devoid of his days in the flesh. Not only the doctrine of the docetism, it'd be nice if you also understood that today, um, in most nations of the world, the modern nations of the world, when it comes to Christian theology, there's something they call process theology. In process theology, they tell us that God is not the omnipotent, omniscient, almighty God that you know our own theology claims him to be. In the process theology, they say that God is affected by temporal processes and that God himself is on a learning curve when it comes to the things of life. And that... Um, the presupposition that he never changes is not really true. That's process theology. Now, when you uh, put all these things together and you look at church today, you find out that some of the world is coming to the church and some of the church is coming to the world. For you to be able to easily pick up what I call the discrepancies and some of the things that I listen to in the dollars uh, administration, that I believe one has to be very careful of, you know, because there are just a few drops of arsenic in a glass. You wouldn't define it as a glass of juice no more. It becomes a glass of poison. And like I said, there's a caveat of this. If I am wrong, I'd like you to correct me as we begin to look at these issues. Now, if you check this out very well, you find out that um, a lot of modern thinking today has been influenced by some of the philosophers who thoroughly interrogated Christianity. One of them was Friedrich Nietzsche. In fact, a lot of the modern beliefs today is based on uh, the existential, nihilistic existentialism of Friedrich Nietzsche, the philosopher. He, he said something, he said, a degree of culture, and assuredly a very high one, is attained when man rises above superstition and religious notions and fears. And for instance, he no longer believes in guardian angels or in the original sin and has also ceased to talk of the salvation of his soul. Now, that is Friedrich Nietzsche, who I said to you, by the time you like interrogate his um, existential, nihilistic existentialism, you begin to understand some of the doctrines that are creeping in the church today. Um, one of his cohorts, Jean-Paul Sartre, who a lot of philosophers also know about, listened to one of his views. He said, before you come alive, life is nothing. It's up to you to give it a meaning. And value is nothing else but the meaning that you choose. 
Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre again tells us why relativism is so grounded today all over the world, influencing policies in nations of the world, influencing so many things that traditionally had been assumed to be fixed. Now, what Jean-Paul Sartre is talking about here is the fact that today, for instance, they tell you that even words absolutely have no fixed meanings because there are no borders. They tell you now today, when you interrogate the whole situation, you find out that philosophically, um, when somebody says something, the hair can attach to it his own meanings, even though the, the person who speaks has his own definitions in, in mind, which takes them to the point where they say there's actually absolutely no absolute uh, moral truths. That is, there's nothing that is really good or bad, good or evil, but it depends on the interpretation that you choose to, in your locality, give to it. Which means that God is not the one who's allowed to define what good and evil is. Now, um, let me take a few more quotes. Baruch Spinoza, in the 17th century, this was one of the cutting-edge philosophers, he was Dutch. He says, if men were born free, they would, so long as they remain free, form no conception of good and evil. That's Baruch Spinoza. Now, what does this tell you? You see, in the realm of the spirit, when it comes to spiritual education, there are some things that are extremely important. You see, the word always contains an image in spiritual communication. Remember that primarily, the, 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 God speaks through images, primarily, the language of the realm of the spirit. Um, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, what seest thou? I see the rod of an almond tree. Old Testament, in the New Testament, you see, and a wonder appeared in heaven, a dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and then another wonder, a woman who was clothed in the sun and all that, in pictures. Why? When you wrap pictures into words and release them, let's say to a believer, for instance, God now sends his Holy Spirit to unravel the image that the word contains, so that the image in your heart and the image in God's heart will be the same then there will be an accuracy, then the concept that God is trying to pass across to you gets across to you accurately. But if, for instance, a man speaks a word and he says something like chair, and in his mind he's talking about a seti or a divan or something, but in your mind, the picture you receive by the time the communication is over is that of, uh, let's say, an armchair or something else completely. There has been a misconception. And that misconception will lead to an error. And that's the reason why the average the believer today needs the Holy Spirit to help to interpret the Word of God. And that's why we say that the letter heals, but it's the Spirit that gives life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you're going to understand why I say we should go and listen to Creflo's ministrations properly and subject them to the tests of Scripture, lest the Nigerian church you know, absorb hoha what he has imported for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, verse 4 says, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which have not received, or another gospel. You see, the Bible talks about another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. The average church goer today actually has not done much when it comes to listening to how to, you know, um, rightly divide the word of God. And that's why you're going to find out something. Listening to Creflo Dollar and all that he had to say about sin, I thoroughly understand the kind of challenges because you see, it's very frustrating when you get born again and you're told that, oh, now you're free of sin. Uh, he that is born of God uh, has overcome sin, has overcome the world. He that is born of God does not sin. A whole lot of scriptures that excite you. Then in your practical work, you discover somewhere along the way that sometimes you just miss it. And there's nothing more terrible than having been a Christian for 10, 12, 13 years or maybe even being a pastor or a minister and you find out that sin is still in recording. Now, what to do with that sin? You go back to scriptures to find out how do we handle this issue of sin. And the truth is this. If you go into scriptures and check what Apostle Paul did in the book of Romans, chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, up to 10, 
you will find out that, watch this, there's a dynamic approach to how to handle sin and overcome sin. In fact, imagine an apostle like Paul shouting, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin? Because earlier on he had laid it out that the things that I want to do in me, I don't do them. The things I say I'm not going to do, those things I end up you know, majoring and doing those things. And he began to point out to us that there was an inner man and an outer man in every believer. As a matter of fact, when he was going to conclude it to show us the way to go, he pointed out to us that, look, there's something called a law of sin and death and a law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, when we come back together and I begin to like um, take the details of that ministration and um, the extensions of grace and the reality that it actually has is they're trying to deal with sin and when we come and look into the scriptures with simplicity to see what the scripture proscribes you'll find out that after listening to Creflo I may have been wrong but I came away with the impression that he, they feel that since Jesus Christ paid the price for sin which is um, he did it in, in time but this, his price for sin the blood of Jesus Christ covers your sins in the past, present, and the future, which technically is true. They feel that today, as a believer, when you go, you don't really want to sin. That's right, you have an inner man who doesn't want to sin. And that if you end up sinning, though, you should simply chalk it up to grace. You don't even need to repent or make any confessions of repentance because then maybe they feel that it's um, strengthening guilt and... Uh, the, the notion that uh, unrighteousness now begins to like, uh, take root more in you. Now, nothing could be further than the, from the truth because if you look into the scriptures properly, you're going to find out that the first thing the Bible tells us is this. Number one, if you're going to assess this, and we are going to, but I'm just dropping one or two things before I close in this session. Number one, the Bible tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and it's always righteousness. And then, you know, all the things we seek will be added unto us. Why am I saying so? Every ministration that you're listening to, always watch out to, to connect it to the kingdom of God. How does this connect to the kingdom of God? Because any ministration whatsoever where it is difficult, that the images you go away with cannot connect with the definition of God's kingdom, the, the culture of God's kingdom, the citizenship of God's kingdom, and what the things that power the, the concepts in God's kingdom, the, even the things like uh, the mysteries of the kingdom or the keys of the kingdom. If at the end of the day the ministration doesn't connect directly to the kingdom of God, it may be a feel-good ministration, a nice ministration titillating to the flesh, but it did not start in Jesus Christ and it did not end with Jesus Christ. I tell you the truth, there's a disconnection from the kingdom. So you need to watch out for that first of all, to use that ministration to establish how does this expand the kingdom of God. How does this affect the kingdom of God, the character of the products of the kingdom of God? Now let's put that aside for a minute. But if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, one of the other things that you're going to discover is that this is not preached about much, but there's something that comes with the package of salvation called the mind of Christ. Now the mind of Christ is a capture that operates your intelligence. And like what all minds do is that it processes thoughts. Now, the thoughts of God are so numerous, so powerful, so glorious, that the human mind cannot process the thoughts of God. So the gift that God gives to us is the mind of Christ, which we activate by studying scripture and by the Holy Spirit working with us. And when the mind of Christ is working, listen, if you tell 20 people the same story, they will have 20 different narratives. Okay? But... When God speaks to us to make sure we don't have 20 different narratives, he has sent to us the mind of Christ. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You'll find that there. And let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus is not a joke. And what the Bible says, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. It just means this. No matter how brilliant you are, your intellectual mind, your religious mind, or any other mindset will never interpret the words of God with accuracy. So what am I saying? I think Creflo Dollar's interpretations were very, very academic. They were very, very intelligent. But I could not see a processing that involved the activation of the mind of Christ and spiritual education, which is taught by comparing spiritual to spiritual.
We'll talk about these things, but I just said and aired this so that we can all take a good look at these things very well and judge whether it be from God so that this job thing, if it be not, be not of God, we can put a stop to it. I personally don't think it is. But when we get together and I begin to break the details, you can tell me whether you disagree with what I'm saying, especially if you're operating in the mind of Christ, and if it does not tally with the scripture, and uh, you can also tell me what you believe he was trying to say, and let us see whether um, we have a problem on our hands in Nigeria or not. But whatever it is, we'll be back together again to thrash out the sinful, sinless generation in Nigeria. God bless you.